Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this brief talk on gonioscopy and the applications of gonioscopy in some surgical procedures. I'm Professor Clement Tam from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. I'm also the Vice President of the Asia Pacific Glaucoma Society. Before I start, I have to acknowledge the Asia Pacific Glaucoma Society pro for providing the contents, especially the slides of this uh, particular talk through the APGS Image Educational Project. These are my financial disclosures. Now, first of all, why do I need to perform gonioscopy? I think it is, first of all, very important for a correct diagnosis. It is done initially for all eyes with hypermetropia or shallow anterior chamber, and also for all glaucoma patients and glaucoma suspects. I think it needs to be repeated periodically for eyes with primary angle closure disease, at least annually, unless the patient has become pseudophagic. The different methods of gonioscopy include direct gonioscopy and indirect gonioscopy, and it can be done without or with indentation. Now first, let's look at direct gonioscopy. Direct gonioscopy uh, has to be performed with a direct gonioscope, and the Copy lens is one of these examples. This lens has to be placed on the eye of the patient with the patient lying supine. Usually, a, a separate light source has to be handheld to provide lighting, and a portable slit lamp has to be used to look uh, through the uh, direct gonioscope to, view a, to have a panoramic view of the drainage angle. Now, the, one of the advantages of direct gonioscopy is that it provides a straight-on view, and it provides also a very wide panoramic view. And so for, in situations such as angle re recession, it allows a very good comparison of different segments of the angle. But the disadvantage is that it is relatively less convenient with the patient needing to lie down, and we also need special equipment such as portable slit lamp and a handheld light source to perform this. Another example of the direct gonioscope is the Swan Jacob lens, which can often be used in various uh, surgical procedures requiring direct visualization of the drainage angle, but I'll come back to this later on in this talk. For indirect gonioscopy, one example of the lens used is the Goldman Three Mirror Lens. Usually in indirect gonioscopy, uh, the image is viewed through a mirror. Now, to perform indirect gonioscopy, the patient has to, first of all, sit very comfortably at the slit lamp with the eye being leveled uh, at, the, at the black uh, marker line. Usually, a coupling agent in the form of a, a methyl cellulose gel has to be placed on the concave surface of the lens. The patient is then asked to look up at the slit lamp and we evert the lower eyelid and the lens then touches the eye with the inferior border of the concave surface. The lens is then rolled forward towards the eye while the patient is asked to look straight ahead. And then the cornea comes into contact with the, with the uh, concave uh, surface of the lens. Another option for indirect gonioscopy is the Posner four mirror lens. And um, this photo shows uh, examples of this. This can be placed on the patient's eye once again at the slit lamp, with the patient first of all looking upwards, and then the lens rotates towards the patient's eye, and the patient is asked to look straight towards the lens, and then contact takes place. Now, usually, uh, at the slit lamp, when using uh, uh, indirect gonioscope, we need a magnification of about 10 to 25 times. We have to use a very short and narrow beam of light to make sure that there's no slit lamp lighting directly going through the pupil, which can induce pupillary constriction. Furthermore, this has to be performed in a completely darkened room to avoid uh, any uh, pupil constriction due to light. The advantage of indirect gonioscopy is first of all, it is uh, very quick and convenient to perform. It can be done at the slit lamp, which allows a variable magnification and illumination, and it also allows the creation of a corneal wedge, which I'll come back to very shortly. 
Indirect gonioscopy also allows the differentiation of appositional and sinecule angle closure through indentation techniques. But the disadvantage of indirect gonioscopy includes the fact that you are looking at the mirror image, which can sometimes be confusing. And also, if there is inadvertent pressure on the cornea, the, the width of the drainage angle can be misleading. Say, for example, if you're using a larger, the, the Goldman lens with a larger contact area, you may exaggerate the degree of angle narrowing with inadvertent pressure. Whereas if you are using a four mirror lens with a much smaller contact area, you may inadvertently open up the drainage angle with uh, excess pressure on the cornea. Now the corneal wedge refers to um, the, the light beam lighting up the anterior uh, surface of the, of the cornea and also the light and, and the posterior surface of the cornea. And this light beam um, meet at the Schwabe's line as shown in the, in the diagram here. So the point where the two light beams, the anterior and posterior light beams meet is the Schwabe's line. And this helps us identify the Schwabe's line and also the anatomical structures in relation to the Schwabe's line, in particular to trabecular meshwork. Now say for example, on the, on the left-hand side uh, diagram here, this is an eye with a pigmented angle, uh, possibly with previous inflammation. Very often in these eyes, you can see multiple lines of pigmentation. And sometimes it will be difficult to say which particular line is the pigmented trabecular meshwork. But when you apply the corneal wedge, you can see that this is the anterior surface of the corneal stroma, and this is the posterior surface of the cornea. And the point where these two lines meet, this represents the Schwabe's line. If the Schwabe's line is pigmented, if the Schwabe's line is pigmented, it is sometimes called the Sempelessis line, and the trabecular meshwork is seen posterior to the uh, Schwabe's line or the Sempelessis line. And the other pigmented lines uh, anterior to it are, are not uh, the trabecular meshwork. The corneal wedge is also particularly useful in very pale drainage angles when there's no pigmentation. Say, for example, in this particular diagram here, the apex of the corneal wedge represents the Schwabe's line, and posterior to this is the area of the trabecular meshwork. Even though it is not pigmented in this particular eye, but it, the corneal wedge allows us to identify its location. When the iris covers the trabecular meshwork, it is very easy to mistake the non-pigmented trabecular meshwork for the sclerospur, and also to mistake a pigmented Schwabe's line for the trabecular meshwork. Indentation gonioscopy, when combined with corneal wedges, are particularly useful in these situations. Now, in this gonioscopic view of the angle, you can see that there's no visible angle structures. Under these circumstances, we would next have to decide whether this is a sinecule or an appositional closure, and we can then perform indentation. With indentation, you can see that now the angle has opened up with the trabecular meshwork reviewed. So this is appositional angle closure. And in this particular eye, you can also see a very distinct double hump configuration of the anterior surface of the iris. The reason for the iris being in this double hump configuration is because of a very prominent and anteriorly positioned uh, ciliary body that is pushing against the peripheral iris. This is a very classic example of plateau iris configuration. The other hump, which is more anterior and more central, represents the iris draping over the anterior surface of the uh, physiological lens. Now, the width of the angle can be graded using various systems, and I personally prefer the Schaefer, or more accurately, the modified Schaefer system. In the original Schaefer system for angle classification, it depends on the, the, the actual uh, absolute angle width, Whereas in the modified Schaefer system, it depends on what you see through gonioscopy. And so if the Schwabe's line is not visible, it is grade zero and closed. If the Schwabe's line is just visible, it is grade one. If you can see trabecular meshwork, then it is grade two. Whereas if you can see sclerospur, it is grade three. And when the ciliary band is also visible, it is wide open and we call it grade four. 
In surgical applications of direct gonioscopy, one procedure that can make use of this is the goniosiniculysis. This is basically a, a procedure that involves a mechanical lysis of peripheral anterior sinicae to re-expose the natural drainage channels of the trabecular meshwork to aqueous. Now this has often need to be performed uh, under an operating microscope and uh, depending on the gonioscope lens being used, sometimes you would have to tilt the microscope at 30 to 45 degrees. Now this is a swan Jacob lens that is being used in a goniosiniculysis procedure. And this surgical video shows you the direct gonioscopic view of the drainage angle with the anterior chamber deepened by viscoelastic. A peripheral corneal wound uh, uh, incision is made and this uh, uh, blunt and cannulated spatula is then passed into the anterior chamber and the, the blunt tip is then used to separate the peripheral anterior sinicae from the drainage angle. You can see that it is pulled, the angle is mechanically pulled open and the trabecular meshwork is once again exposed. This procedure is often combined with phaco emulsification because after cataract extraction, the anterior chamber is much deepened and it's much easier to perform this procedure as well as with a much better visualization of the drainage angle. So finally, important take home messages from this talk, gonioscopy should be a fundamental part of your ophthalmic evaluation. It helps you determine the narrowness or closure of the anterior chamber angle and also helps you grade the angle width. It also helps you identify any pathology within the drainage angle and it needs to be performed routinely and repeated regularly in certain patients. Last but not least, if you are interested in more glaucoma contents, please mark in your diary the 2021 Asia Pacific Glaucoma Congress, which will be held in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia in August. The exact dates will be announced very soon, depending on the pandemic situation. So thank you very much once again for your time, and I look forward to meeting you in person in one of our future Congresses. Thank you.